Alrighty, well, welcome everybody to the June 1st edition of the uh, COVID situation report for our local community. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. My name is Brittany Cadence. I'm the communications manager for Peterborough Public Health. And um, I would just like to um, start off uh, with some um, uh, some key messages regarding the the current uh, situation uh, that we find ourselves in from a in terms of our supporting our indigenous communities. As we gather today, I would like to honor the indigenous communities across Canada and recognize the tragedy of the residential school system highlighted recently by the mass grave of 215 people uh, children discovered at the Kamloops residential school. This situation reminds us of our collective and individual role to support the calls to action put forth by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So within this context, I would like to begin with a, a deep breath for everybody and uh, to honour the land that we find ourselves on. So Peterborough Public Health respectfully acknowledges that we are located on the Treaty 20 Michisagic territory and in the traditional territory of the Michisagic and Chippewa nations collectively known as the Williams Treaty's First Nations, which include Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Rama, Beausoleil, and Georgina Island First Nations. Peterborough Public Health respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty's First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. We are all treaty people. Okay, and with that, um, we'll now invite our uh, Board of Health Chair, uh, Mayor Andy Mitchell, to begin with some opening remarks. Please go ahead, Mayor Mitchell. Uh, thanks, Brittany, and uh, also thank you for recognizing the tragedy of the residential schools and the importance of the calls of, to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This past week has been a marked improvement in our local battle against COVID-19. The week ending on Sunday saw the fewest number of cases, 41, in the past nine weeks. Our active cases have declined to 47, and our close contacts are down to 149. We have also seen good news on the vaccine front. We have reached the 60% target of local residents having received at least one dose by May 31st. As of last Thursday, 72,920 residents have received one dose and 6,659 have received a second dose. The province's plan for second doses will soon be rolling out locally. You're doing it, Peterborough. All this is good news, but the reality is we are at a crossroads. Go too slowly, people's exhaustion and the economic hurt will push people to ignore the rules and make their own. Go too fast, and we risk a resurgence that will only prolong the return to normalcy. I believe the weeks ahead need to be guided by some fundamental approaches. First, allow and encourage less risky outdoor activities with rules that make sense, expand the number of things we can do, and permit sport and recreation. Secondly, return gradually to indoor activities that can be done safely, where monitoring for adherence to public guidelines is possible, and or where capacities can be limited. Thirdly, continue to vaccinate as quickly as possible and demonstrate that a vaccinated population means more normal activities can take place. And fourth, monitor and prepare for the inevitable flare-ups of the virus. This includes making more rapid testing available, robust case management, and targeting vaccines to populations most at risk. As encouraging as the news is, it is important that we all continue to be vigilant. The road to normalcy is clear. However, if we try to go too fast, we will take longer to reach our destination and delay our return to doing the things that help make life special. Stay safe, be well, and in all things, be kind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Mitchell. Okay, so now to uh, share the latest data with regard to our local uh, COVID situation, uh, Dr. Salvatera is here. Please go ahead, Dr. Salvatera. 
Thank you, Brittany. And uh, it's great to be sharing some good news. As you've heard from Mayor Mitchell, uh, after six straight days of with, uh, with single digit uh, new case counts, I am pleased to report that there are currently uh, 47 active cases as of 4 p.m. yesterday, and that this is 33 less than Friday, uh, as considerably more cases are resolving than new ones are being reported. So we're on the positive side of this. Uh, the number of close contacts has also seen a sharp decline and now stands at 147 individuals that we are following. That's 57 fewer than Friday's report. Sadly, though, we are reporting another death since our last briefing. This brings uh, to 21 the uh, number of people in our community who have died from uh, COVID-19, and I extend my condolences to all those families. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, this, uh, I can't see it, so I'm going to trust that it's up. Uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, this is our uh, weekly reporting and new cases by reported date. And you can see that last week we reported 41 new cases uh, and uh, that uh, we certainly haven't seen a case count that low since uh, mid-March. Uh, and it certainly appears from the graph that our third wave has crested. Next slide, please. Um, you should be seeing the monthly bar graph. Again, I'm not seeing it. So, oh, there it is. I'm not sure why it's coming and going. Uh, but uh, here you'll see that the final number of new cases reported in May was uh, 272. And that makes it the second highest month for new cases so far in our region uh, during the pandemic. The next slide will give you our uh, breakdown of cases and you can see still slightly more men than women uh, consistent with the rest of the province, uh, which is also reporting more males than female cases. Uh, when we look at ages, we see again those under 29 years of age representing the highest number of cases to date. Uh, another 20 cases were reported in that group uh, under 29 just last week alone. And uh, we, I certainly hope that our youth clinics coming up uh, in June uh, will be an opportunity for us to provide uh, protection to this group. Uh, and certainly now that uh, they're all eligible, that we can uh, try and uh, prevent transmission. So in our next slide, we're looking at exposures. Uh, and over the past week, we continue to see uh, consistently that the uh, sources remain the same. That's close contacts. Uh, we've seen uh, community spread inching up slightly, uh, but uh, when we look at the province as a whole, Peterborough is reporting uh, one of the lowest rates of, uh, of community spread, so that's good to know. And uh, good to see that our travel-related cases have really uh, dropped off considerably. So thank you, Peterborough. Thank you for staying home and staying local. Let's look at testing. We had another 450 people tested for the first time last week. That uh, brings the total to 52,500 or about one third of our population that's been tested at least once. This is uh, a little lower than uh, the weekly rate was a little lower than a few weeks ago uh, when we were reporting about 700 people uh, uh, being tested uh, weekly. So that's dropped off a little. For outbreaks, we are now reporting uh, four active outbreaks. We had a workplace outbreak resolved during the weekend. Uh, we had a new one declared. We also declared a new outbreak at Riverview Manor uh, where two staff have tested positive. All of the uh, other outbreaks, including the one at Fairhaven are stable. 
So I wanted to present uh, a brief update on our vaccination rollout. I know there is lots of demand for second doses in Peterborough, and that's great to see. Unfortunately, there is more demand than we have supply. Uh, and so for our senior residents who are over 80 years of age, uh, who are now eligible as of yesterday for a second dose, uh, I know you must be frustrated. Uh, we did not have any doses uh, appointments open yesterday, uh, but we are uh, hoping to post as soon as we get uh, confirmation of supply. Uh, so I urge you to check back in a few days or uh, to look at whether or not you might be able to get your second dose at one of our local pharmacies. Um, in fact, we will see pharmacies play a larger role in our vaccine uh, rollout in the weeks and months to come. Uh, we are seeing their supply uh, increase steadily. Uh, important to know that the pharmacies will be providing either Moderna or Pfizer, so you need to check before you book your appointment. Uh, and I uh, understand that Brittany is going to take you for a quick tour of the website to show you how that works. So over to you, please, Brittany. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Salvatera. So um, yes, uh, this is the way uh, the provincial booking system works if you are looking to book your second dose at a pharmacy. So I thought I would just walk you through the steps. Um, the uh, website you can use is, is up in the browser window, or you can easily just type in ontario.ca slash book vaccine, and it brings you to this window. Uh, so I'm going to mimic as if I was over 80 and wanting to book my second dose at a pharmacy. So when I get to this window, uh, then you would hit, um, you are looking to get your second dose of the vaccine and then it walks you through a series of questions ensuring that you um, have at least the minimum interval between your vaccines then you enter your postal code uh, and then your birth year so we will do that and uh, then a few other questions just to stream you um, appropriately and assuming that that you don't have any um, health risks you can just um, put none of the above there. And then assuming you have the standard green Ontario health card, I've activated that. So then when you hit get results, you uh, receive these two options. And option A is to book uh, through the provincial system, which would take you to one of the uh, uh, mass vaccination clinics that are run by Peterborough Public Health. But if you go over to B, you can see you can choose a participating pharmacy. So I will now click on find a pharmacy. And um, again, there's some information uh, that, that uh, to give you um, about the, um, you'll wanna look for which vaccine is offered at the different pharmacies. So I'm going to show you that. So there's, there's two ways that you can look for local pharmacies. You can go through the long alphabetical list to the right, or you can again, just put in the first few letters of your postal code and do a search. Um, and then it brings up, in this case, Peterborough Pharmacies. So here we have them listed. It says 20 locations found. And I like to draw your attention to where it says vaccine type. And you see, for example, at the Loblaw Pharmacy, it's offering Moderna uh, vaccine and that it is only for 18 or older. Uh, same with the uh, Shoppers Simply Pharmacy on George Street. And I'm just going to keep scrolling so you can see so we have at the Shoppers Drug Mart on Charlotte Street, uh, that's that's offering the Pfizer vaccine, which for is for ages 12 or older. So it is important to know which vaccine you received first so that when you are selecting a pharmacy, you can uh, get the same va vaccine at the at the pharmacy. Um, so that's and then you would just uh, follow the directions for that location in terms of how you book and each pharmacy is doing it a little differently. So you would just have to uh, go to their website and find out what their steps are. So that's um, uh, an overview there. So I will throw it back to um, Dr. Salvatera. 
Thanks so much, Brittany. And uh, as Brittany said, the pharmacies are using their own booking systems. So uh, you do need to follow the instructions. Uh, please don't overwhelm our local pharmacies. They're doing their best, uh, but they are moving uh, uh, really high quantities of uh, vaccine across the province, doing a great job of that. Uh, so, uh, and, and they do have access to the same uh, COVAX Ontario system, which does record your immunizations. So they will be able to find you and confirm when you were immunized and with which dose to make sure that you are indeed eligible for a second dose and which vaccine that will be. So I also wanted to show you a slide. Thank you very much, Brittany. This is the one on the second dose eligibility, uh, just so you can see how the province has laid out their plan. Uh, it's also captured in our vaccine eligibility tool on our website. Uh, and you can see the, the plan here. If I draw your attention to children, youth and young adults, the plan is that they will all get their second doses in August. Uh, two weeks before the start of the new school year. Uh, you'll see that the next group that becomes eligible uh, on June the 14th is the 70 and over group. Uh, so that that's when they can start to reschedule their second doses uh, on uh, as of June 14th. By, we, by the time we get to the end of month, uh, we'll start to see appointments opening up for people uh, for an earlier second dose according to the date of the first dose. Uh, and for people who don't have an appointment for a second dose, you still can go in when you become eligible and book a single dose. Again, the, the COVAX will, will recognize you they, uh, and will know when you got your first dose and will give you uh, an opportunity to schedule your second dose. I also want to emphasize that if you have a second dose scheduled and you just want to wait for that because it's the most convenient for you, that that's a choice as well. Um, the last thing I want to touch on today is just that yesterday the province did announce that all long-term care homes and uh, retirement homes in Ontario will have to have an immunization policy for their staff in place by July 1st. Uh, and uh, right now, as of, as of just a few days ago, it is estimated that uh, about 89% of long-term care home staff have had at least one dose, uh, and that about 66% are fully immunized. So I do uh, support this uh, move by the Ministry of Long-Term Care Home. I think it's important to have clear expectations for long-term care home staff and retirement home staff as they are taking care of vulnerable residents who may not be able to mount an immune response uh, from a vaccine uh, and for whom uh, any encounter with the coronavirus may be life-threatening. So all healthcare workers workers do have an ethical duty to care uh, and a duty not to harm, even if it's unintentional, their patients. Uh, Long-term care homes are already required to report their influenza immunization rates for their staff. Uh, and I know that many of our local facilities take great pride in their high uptake rates. We've uh, worked closely with this sector for many years to support their influenza vaccination uh, for staff. And I certainly look forward to doing the same for COVID-19. So just one last thing, and that is that uh, we have uh, appointments available right now online for our youth clinics that are scheduled the week of June 14th. So for parents of 12 to 17 year olds, uh, please uh, take a moment, go online and uh, ensure that your uh, children have appointments. We wanna get them ready 
for, for school and the best way to protect them is with COVID-19 vaccines. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll uh, give it back to you, uh, Brittany. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Salvatera. Okay, uh, so we now have an opportunity to hear from our local elected officials. Um, I see Mary Tarian is with us. Did you have any remarks or would you just like to be available for questions, Mary Tarian? Hi, Brittany. Um, just, just quickly, people will notice that the downtown, um, the look downtown is changing where staff have been busy implementing um, the safe bike lanes, the curbside pickup, as well as the on-street patio space for when we're able to reopen. Um, so crews are out installing that. So you'll notice some changes when you head downtown, um, Hunter Street and Charlotte Street being one way again, for example, similar to um, what we did last summer. So again, we're doing everything that we can to ensure the health and safety of residents uh, and also facilitating uh, healthy spaces for businesses to reopen um, when they're permitted to operate. Um, so just keep an eye out for that. And, um, and yes, I'll be around for questions after. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Tarion. Excellent. Okay, um, so Lee, we will now um, get a chance to hear some questions from our media guests. And uh, also joining us, we have representatives uh, from the Peterborough Police Service and uh, Ontario Provincial Police. So if there are enforcement related questions, uh, you can direct them that way. So let's start with um, Paul Rellinger from Kawartha Now. Please go ahead, Paul. <clears throat> Thanks so much, uh, Brittany. Uh, for Dr. Salvatera, a couple things. Uh, do you have any details or more details on the Riverview Manor outbreak, uh, staff, um, residents or? Uh, what I can share is that it's uh, so far there are two cases, Paul, and they are both in staff. Uh, I know we've been in uh, that uh, the, the facility has been testing. They t will test everyone uh, and I haven't seen the results of that yet, but currently I know we're, we're, we have the two cases there. Okay. And uh, and again, I'm sorry to have to bring it up uh, regarding the person who passed away, a, a community member or? Yes, unfortunately, uh, we did lose another community member uh, recently, uh, someone who was ill and in the ICU at uh, at the hospital. Okay, thank you. And uh, just one more thing. You mentioned uh, testing uh, numbers are down a little bit from what they were earlier in the month. And I'm just wondering what the correlation to lower cases is with less testing. Um, we see that, we see, again, I didn't mean to interrupt, but we see that yeah. province-wide where Right now we're under a thousand, but testing is way down as well. So what can we conclude from that? Well, it, you have to be careful, of course, because I mean, I think the, the first thing that comes to mind, the first hypothesis would be that fewer people, fewer people are sick um, or fewer people have been in contact with cases. And both might indeed be true. I mean, we've seen the case count drop in Peterborough. Uh, we've seen, and with case counts dropping, the numbers of people who are identified as high-risk contacts also drops. And we typically have to send all of those folks for testing at least twice during their self isolation period. So right there, you can see an ex the, you, you have an explanation, but what you don't want to assume, you don't want to make that assumption uh, because it, it, again, uh, if people don't go for testing and you'll recall that early in the pandemic, when we didn't have enough testing, we weren't testing everyone. We were only testing people who were more ill. And so the numbers were low, but it wasn't because we didn't have cases, we had them in the community, they just weren't being tested, which is where the wastewater surveillance comes in, Paul, as a really good backup uh, piece of information because the wastewater surveillance that we're doing, and we're doing it upstream as well as at the Peterborough uh, City wastewater treatment, and I understand we'll be beginning it soon in Cavan Monaghan as well, but that you know, doesn't depend on people going to get tested. You know, if you use a toilet in Peterborough, you are part of that wastewater surveillance. So it's a much more um, reliable, I would say, source of information. So we continue to watch those numbers and uh, we will be presenting the latest data uh, uh, later this week. We typically present that data on Friday. 
Uh, great. That's a great explanation. Thanks so much, Dr. Salvatera, and that's all for me, Brittany. Great. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Um, all right. I see Matt Latour is with us from uh, Freak and Oldies Radio. So if you've got some questions, please go ahead, Matt. Uh, I do. I've got a couple for Dr. Salvatera. Um, I know the news came down last week that uh, Dr. Kieran Moore would be taking over as the new top doctor in Ontario. I was just wondering if you know this new doctor, or if you have any experience with him, and uh, if so, what are your thoughts on him? Oh, yes, I have had the great fortune of working with uh, Kieran on a number of, of initiatives. I have tremendous respect and admiration for Dr. Moore. Uh, I think he's an excellent choice for a chief medical officer of health and I've already sent him my congratulatory um, best wishes and I'm looking forward to working with him. What do you think he brings to the table that might be different than what Dr. Williams currently brings? Well, they both bring uh, the perspective of, of the local the local uh, public health unit and and uh, and that Dr. Williams having worked in Thunder Bay for many years, so they share that. Um, I mean, Kieran um, is uh, is a strong communicator. Um, I know he likes to use flip charts, so we'll have to wait and see whether he brings his flip charts with him or or, or uh, uses other methods to illustrate his point. He's certainly a data person. He has was instrumental in uh, in uh, the province um, setting up uh, our one of our current surveillance systems that we run out of emergency departments. So we have real-time surveillance in uh, hospital emergency departments, and that's very much thanks to the pioneering work of Dr. Kieran Moore. So he'll, he's strong on data, strong on communications, uh, fresh from the local scene, uh, and has a very, as director of the Public Health and Preventive Medicine Program at Queen's University, certainly has a very strong academic and research uh, background as well that he will bring to the position. Perfect. And my last question, unrelated to all that, um, of course, uh, is about recreation. And I know it's something that we might see more in, I guess, stage or phase two of reopening, uh, but more so outdoor team sports like basketball, soccer, things like that, even football of that nature. Um, do you think these sports will look different, you know, post vaccine once people do get these vaccines? Well, eventually, Matt, that is that is the hope that once everyone is fully protected, that we will be able to, uh, you know, re loosen some of those public health measures like masking and distancing. And if you uh, look to the CDC in the U.S., where uh, they are a little ahead of us as far as second dose. Um, uh, administration, you can already start to see what the future might look like, where uh, people who are with others who are fully immunized uh, are able to loosen up and, uh, and potentially, uh, in your example, participate in sports without wearing masks, for example, or without having to, uh, to be uh, conscious of the, of the need for distancing. So I do think that's in the future. Uh, not sure when we'll get to it, but I know we have lots of people in the community who are eagerly awaiting it. So for them, I would say get immunized, you know, start the process of making sure you're protected. Perfect. And I know a bunch of news coming down from NASI today about mixing vaccines and whatnot. Is this, I assume, welcome news for you to see? Yes, and we are eagerly awaiting that news here in Peterborough, where we've had thousands of people who've had the first dose of AstraZeneca. They are going to be eligible in about another week to receive a second dose of AstraZeneca or to potentially receive uh, a dose of a messenger RNA vaccine like Pfizer or Moderna. So we are eagerly awaiting the NACI statement. I understand some of the provinces may have had a sneak peek and are already uh, operationalizing it. Here in Ontario, we are waiting to see it in writing. Perfect. And um, I'm not sure if MP Monsef is on, um, but maybe you would know about this as well. Is there any update on Johnson & Johnson status and whether or not that'll be available anytime soon? 
I do know in that uh, we did discuss it just on the weekend with the vaccine task force. And unfortunately, there's been no news on that Janssen vaccine. It continues to be held. Uh, and I know we do have a few people here in Peterborough who are, are allergic and are uh, eagerly awaiting the Janssen. And uh, they're just going to have to be patient uh, and hopefully we'll get some news. But right now there's been nothing new. That's it for me. Thank you. OK. OK, great. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, OK, joining us uh, from Peterborough this week in my cohort, Bill Hodgins. Do you have some questions for Dr. Salvatera? Uh, yeah, yes. First for Dr. Salvatera. Um, regarding mandatory vaccines, uh, you mentioned a, a policy for healthcare workers in retirement homes and long term care. And we see that Trent is joining a few others and requiring it for students living in residence. I'm just wondering if you think it's inevitable that we'll see a lot more of this in society. Yeah, I do. Uh, I mean, I would support that. Uh, having, um, for example, the whether it's a long-term care staff or a student returning to residence, having them fully immunized does decrease their risk. Uh, and so, uh, and the risk of transmission to others. So it makes sense. Uh, we certainly know that uh, currently in Ontario, we have mandatory immunization for students. Uh, the, uh, the Immunization of School Pupils Act does make it mandatory for all students attending schools to have a certain uh, number of vaccines. And so really, this is just another example of how immunization can be very helpful in protecting certain settings uh, and certain vulnerable populations. Um, can I ask a question of Mayor Terrian, please? Yep, absolutely. Uh, along the same sort of lines, um, government buildings, uh, specifically city-owned bu buildings, do you think that is going to be a requirement and do you think it should be a requirement? I'm thinking in the future when council meetings are open or public meetings are open. That's a good question. I mean, I don't, the municipality doesn't have the authority to force like all of our employees or people coming in to be vaccinated. Um, I think certainly, you know, we will continue to encourage people um, and work with public health to make sure that when we are able to reopen, whether it's city hall or arenas or the library, um, that we're doing it in the safest way possible. Um, but, but again, I, I don't know that there's, um, that we don't have the ability to, you know, um, force people to get vaccinated or to be able to, you know, sort of um, even follow up on that. Like we don't have the right to ask people for personal health data. Um, so we'll just continue to encourage people to get vaccinated. We have, as Dr. Salvatore said, we've had great uptake in our community. Uh, and I think um, we'll continue to, to see that. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, that's all of my questions for now. OK, thank you very much, Bill, and thank you, Mary Tarian. Um, OK, let's hear from Jessica Nisnik from Global News. Do you have some questions today? I do. Thank you, Brittany, for Dr. Salvatera. Okay. Dr. Salvatera, there are unfortunately our latest passing. Um, do you know what day it was on? Um, hmm. I'm trying to think, Jessica, whether I got news on Sunday. Uh, I believe it may have been Sunday. I'm not 100%, but we can certainly look and uh, get back to you on that. Thank you. Um, just because the, the website that we're often that I often check, the provincial one, is often a day behind, which doesn't work great for for news. So um, anything that that um, in the follow up you're able to provide, as in age or gender or anything like that, and, and that leads me to my next question. We've seen an increase in deaths, so I've noticed in the last little while after people have been getting vaccinated. So hmm. I I thought that was going to go the other way. What do you think is, is happening here? Why are we seeing more deaths, and especially with people who've had a first shot already? 
Well, it's interesting. I, I think when we actually looked at that very question, Jessica, we looked and we compared our local crude fatality rates for 2020 and for 2021 so far. And actually the rates are very similar. Uh, so um, I think the reason why we're probably feeling it more and, and, and seeing it more is that uh, we've had more cases in 2021. So it's that third wave. Uh, it hit us hard. We had more people infected. And uh, and that reflects the variance of concern. I mean, when we look at, I'm not surprised that we've seen people dying who've been immunized, just because when we've looked at those cases, the infection was so close to their date of immunization that they didn't have time to mount an immune response. Um, and uh, or uh, in the cases where there had been more of a time lapse, there just wasn't, uh, they had underlying reasons that for their uh, immune response to be uh, not as robust as, as it could have been. So they had some underlying immune uh, uh, situations ha uh, or suppression happening. Uh, I think interestingly to, interesting to note as well as we look ahead at the um, variant of concern, the, um, the B1617 that is being, uh, we certainly are hearing about in the news these days. Uh, there is some preliminary news uh, out of the UK where they've looked at the vaccine efficacy. And definitely with this new vaccine uh, a variant of concern, one dose is not enough. Uh, whether they look, whether it was the Pfizer or the um, the AstraZeneca, they found that the vaccines only had about a 33 percent uh, efficacy rate against the new variant, uh, and that uh, it wasn't until two weeks after the second dose that there was really um, a much better uh, protection. But still, with the uh, AstraZeneca, it was only 60%, uh, and it was 88% uh, with the Pfizer. So that uh, it looks like with this new variant, you really need the two doses, So, uh, which is another reason why we need to be accelerating the second doses now that we have more vaccine and getting as many people protected with that second dose so that they really and truly are protected uh, as much as possible with the vaccine. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you very much, Dr. Salvatera. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, Paul, I see you have your hand up. Did you have a, a question that you wanted to ask before we move on to the others? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. I, I did. I just wanted to clarify. I, uh, Mayor Mitchell indicated we reached 60 percent uh, mm -hmm. vaccination for the eligible po population on the weekend. What's the projection or goal for 70 percent? Is there a, a target date in mind or something in your mind that, that you know, that's possible. <laughs> Paul, it's as soon as possible. Um, and, 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 and seriously, the more vaccine that the province can give us, the faster we'll go. We, we have still additional capacity here in Peterborough when we look at the PRHC clinic and we look at pharmacies and family doctors and nurse practitioners. We still have some extra room to go and all we need is the vaccine. So we don't have a target right now. It's really it's really, you know, to do as much as we can and get those numbers moving as quickly as possible. So tomorrow isn't soon enough then is what you're saying? <laughs> no, I, it's not. I mean, I am I spend a lot of my time advocating for more vaccine. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you uh, for allowing me to interrupt and answering that. I appreciate it. Okay, great. Thanks, Paul. Um, okay, I will now invite uh, Danelda Frazier from the Havelock Rail. Do you have any questions for our speakers today, Danelda? Yes, I do. Uh, for Dr. Self-Tara, uh, I was wondering if the government opens up the, the borders, uh, I don't know how soon that would happen, but do you think they would still, uh, for the Americans coming in to come to their cottage, would they still require them to isolate for 14 days? 
Uh, well, I think now that it's going to it's going to really um, um, be uh, uh, dependent on whether they are fully immunized uh, and whether they have any symptoms and whether they potentially test positive or negative. So I would think that all of those can be used in order to determine whether people need to quarantine. So uh, have they had two doses? Of, of an immunization at more than two weeks ago? Are they symptom free? And, uh, and if there is rapid testing done, are they negative? I think all of those can be used to uh, determine uh, whether or not quarantine is necessary. Okay, thank you very much. That's all for me. Okay, thank you, Danelda, for your question today. Uh, okay, so Rob from Trent Radio, um, if you've got some questions, please go ahead. Sure, thanks, Brittany. Uh, so my first question for Dr. Salvatera, uh, do you have any insight or any expectations for what's going to happen with respect to the stay at home order? I mean, we talked in the past about how we hopefully wouldn't be left in limbo. If I'm not mistaken, that ends tomorrow, as does the current state of emergency. And unless I've missed something, I haven't heard any clear announcements from the province about what's going to happen on Thursday, I guess. Um, so I was wondering if you have any any, either any insight into what's happening or any expectations for your part about what we might see? No, I don't. I, I like you, I am awaiting uh, provincial decisions and provincial announcements. Uh, so we have not been given any heads up on which direction the province will go and what they will do. Um, so it's, it's basically wait and see. I'm hoping that we might hear something today. Okay, right. So at least I haven't missed anything. That's no. a bit of a cup, right? <laughs> All right, thank you. And another question, maybe this is it's better for uh, Brittany, but with you, I think you mentioned on the Peterborough Public Health website, there was a place to see for second doses information about when you might be eligible. Is there a tool like the Notify Me tool where you can sign up and get an email, or is it just the, the documentation that's there around the, the, the current eligibility by age group? Yeah, we, we do have a, um, a detailed uh, page with all the vaccine eligibility de um, uh, information that you need. And I th I think my uh, colleague Sarah Gill just put it in the chat function so you can click right on it. And it does provide second dose eligibility details as well. So we don't have a separate notify me for second doses at this point. Uh, but I think this uh, tool, which is regularly updated, is the best source of information right now. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, that's everything for me. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so um, Joelle from Peterborough Examiner, do you have some questions for our speakers today? Uh, yes, I do, thank you for asking. I was wondering, uh, first of all, from, um, I was wondering, first of all, whether OPP was on the call today. I believe Constable Joe Iatt is with us today. Uh, I can put him up on the screen if his camera is cooperating. There we go. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I note that there were charges on the weekend in Kevin Monaghan around a um, religious gathering. Is there anything more you can tell us about that? Um, it was actually in Autonomy South Monaghan, uh, in Burnham Line. Um, there was a complaint regarding a religious gathering. Um, our officers attended, uh, noticed approximately 50 to 70 people. Um, participating in the religious gathering. The organizer was identified and charged under the reopening. reopening. Okay, I take it this was an outdoor church gathering? It wasn't clear to me. Yeah, yeah, it was outdoors. It was at the back of the property. It was a rural farming property. Uh, I can tell you that it was the same congregation that was holding um, ceremonies at Nickel Global. Um, so like the uh, Peterborough Police Service had stated earlier, uh, maybe a couple weeks ago, they they were gonna become transient, uh, which they have. Um, they've also informed us that they're going to continue holding these services on Sunday. Um, we're just gonna have to track them down and find out where they are. Oh, okay. That that 
that helps enormously. Um, yeah, that makes that much more clear to me. Um, so this was on a private property where they were, they were on a rural property? Yeah, they were on a private property, um, farming land. Um, so the owner was uh, received a warning um, in regards to this and the organizer uh, did receive a charge. Uh, so it was a complaint regarding this. Um, we received information, they've been holding them on the property the last uh, three Sundays, uh, but this was the first complaint that, that we received. So um, if they are transient, if they do move around again, we'll just have to wait and see if, if there's another complaint coming. Thank you so, so much. This really helps. Those details are important. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I have some similar questions for city police. Thank you, Constable Ayat. Um, regarding uh, the usual uh, anti-lockdown um, gathering, whether there was any charges this weekend and whether you expect any further um, any further lock anti-lockdown rallies this weekend. Thank you. D did you want to take that, Inspector Lyons? Uh, yes, Brittany, thank you. Um, hi, Joel. Um, so from the last weekend, uh, the one thing to note was that the uh, <clears throat> the crowd size had uh, dropped considerably from previous weekends. Um, so there wasn't as much as far as um, the uh, two meter distancing, uh, social distancing from each other. Um, they're still actively looking at those involved. Um, charges are always imminent or uh, potentially imminent depending on uh, who's involved as far as organizers. Um, but essentially, uh, the, we expect that these will continue for as long as um, as any of the legislation is in place. Uh, and we will be monitoring, as uh, uh, Council Wyatt alluded to, any and all information that we get as far as gatherings, um, and we'll be monitoring them and resourcing them um, to determine what's happening. Okay, have have they moved elsewhere? As as we've noted with the religious gathering, have they gone? I, I heard about Beaver Mead was discussed as a place, but I'm not sure. Yeah, that's one location that was brought up and has been mentioned on social media. Um, fortunately, it didn't gain any traction. Um, there were, uh, I, I don't believe any attendees, uh, maybe except for one. Um, so it didn't gain any traction, which is which is very fortunate. Um, and maybe just hopefully a sign that some people are just going to hopefully adhere by the legislation and the end is in sight and hopefully they'll see that um, with the numbers that have been coming out lately and showing reductions and the amount of vaccines that we're getting. Um, we're all hoping we can get out and do all those things sooner than later. Now, has there been any move to do uh, uh, shopping trips as large groups of people with no masks on? I, I noticed that there's been uh, mentions on social media, hey, let's all go shopping together without a mask. Now, the only evidence that I've seen that this is actually happening is, is one person who posts himself shopping alone. Is that something that police have been called to here and there across the city or what's the status of that? Uh, so exactly what you've referenced, uh, that's the one uh, source of information that we've received and we've acted upon. Um, and it was only at the one location that we're aware of. Um, there was some talk and there was, there was some bantering about doing this at multiple locations, but again, it didn't gain any traction. So therefore, um, uh, we do tend to, to keep track of what's happening. Uh, and we work in consultation with, you know, fortunately there's our partners involved. We have uh, public health, um, city bylaw, and we do other have pe other peace officers that have been doing um, you know, retail checks from the Ministry of Transportation who have done some compliance checks. So we're constantly trying to monitor everything that's happening and obviously following up on any of those ones that could become problematic. That's helpful. Thank you so very much. I wonder if the mayor is still on the call. Uh, 
Hi, Joelle. I think she's had to step off. So, um, but I think Brendan is with us. If you had a question you wanted to relay to him that he could pass along. Sure, I was just wondering, I received one concern from a resident who uh, uh, is concerned about the temporary patio spaces having been set up in accessible parking spots downtown. Were they set up in accessible parking spots or, or not? And yeah, and has the city received any complaints formally about that? But that's my question, but he may not be there to uh, to answer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you might need to follow up with him directly, Joelle. Okay. My yeah, apologies. absolutely okay. fine. Yep, thank you very much. Um, and uh, just the only other question I have for Dr. Salvatero was regarding those youth clinics. It, it seems like there's appointments open. Now, you said a third of young people, 10 to 17, the other day were very quick to make their appointments. Has it stalled since then? Why is there still availability? Uh, good question. I don't know. I think we need to, uh, we're definitely pursuing it this week and hopefully working with our school board partners to promote the youth clinics. So hopefully we'll get some uh, uptake and, and see those fill up as they, they should. Uh, and because we are also trying to determine whether we need more, you know, in other parts of the, of the county as well. So it's an active part of our planning right now. And, uh, and we'll just have to wait and see. Okay, and are drive through uh, drive throughs still going to be uh, organized, or is that not needed now that there's so much availability at the pharmacies? Right. Well, we don't know. Uh, we have, I mean, drive through uh, have a lot of appeal uh, for many reasons, especially for people with mobility issues who can maybe get, in, you know, you can get them into a seat in a car and not have to move them with a walker or a wheelchair. So there is, there is some, um, definitely, uh, benefits of having, uh, having the, um, the drive through So I think it'll, we'll just have to wait and see, especially with our primary care partners, because I know some of them are really keen and uh, they may decide to offer drive throughs as we get, as the weather continues to, to be good. I can see that being a good option for so many. Now, the very last thing I wanted to ask was you were mentioning that some of the um, people who are in the age band that could um, 80 plus who could book their, second appointment if if they didn't if there was no availability for them to book yesterday they still do have a pre-booked appointment do they not like it's yes. not they just can yes. advance it okay yes they have it uh, for some time probably in july but they do have the opportunity to move it up into june Okay, thank you so much. That makes it much clearer. I'm done. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, Brittany, I just want to add that I've seen the uh, NACI statement has just been released uh, on the mix and match for vaccines. And they are recommending that for people who had AstraZeneca, they can choose either to have a second dose of AstraZeneca or to have either the Pfizer or the Moderna. So that is in writing now, and it's probably online for our media partners who are eager to see it. Oh, that's great news. So we will certainly update our website accordingly uh, in terms of the vaccine eligibility tool. Um, but that's that's wonderful. So breaking news. Excellent. Uh, OK, we have uh, Reg Watson with us also from the examiner. Any last questions um, for our speakers today? Reg? Could I just clarify on the 21st death that was on Sunday? Um, maybe I missed it, but do you have the gender and age range for that, that death? Uh, I believe I do. Let me just see if I have it. So this will be for Jessica as well. So I am just going in and confirming that this, we received this notice on Sunday uh, and it was a male in his 67th year. Oh, okay, thank you. That's everything then. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Salvatera. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, well, so Reg, if that's it, then um, I think that brings us to an end for today's uh, media briefing. So thank you all for, for joining us and um, enjoy this beautiful first day of June. We will see you back here on Friday and uh, stay safe out there. Okay, bye-bye.
Thanks, Brittany. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Brittany. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Brittany.